right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the second episode of the Air Edition podcast. I'm joined here with McKenna today. Last episode, we discussed Jean-Michel Basquiat and street art and kind of the history behind street art. And this time, we'd like to discuss one of our favorite topics in art history, which is actually the Dutch Golden Age. And this is a period that happened in the Dutch Republic in around the 1600s. I like to consider it as kind of the Renaissance period of Northern Europe. So the high Renaissance, which would be like 16th century Italy, that was kind of the height of artistic production in Italy at that time. And I, and I like to consider the Dutch Golden Age as the height of artistic production for Northern Europe. So a little bit of background for this period, the what is now the Netherlands and kind of what we call like the Dutch area was originally under Spanish rule. And the history behind this period kind of begins with the 80 years war, which there was a lot of war going on throughout Europe, but we're specifically focusing on the Netherlands trying to gain independence from Spanish rule and they were under the rule of King Philip II. And at the same time, they were also dealing with the Thirty Years' War, which was also attributed to their independence as well. And that was kind of like the Catholics versus the Protestants. Um, And eventually, the Dutch Republic, which composes of roughly present day the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium. They signed the Peace of Münster on January 30th, 1648, and that was kind of the peace treaty between the Spanish and the Dutch to end the Eighty Years' War. And so that's kind of what historians mark as the beginning of the Dutch Golden Age. Yeah, and going off of that, this kind of sparked the beginning of the Dutch people developing their own culture. They eventually came to a truce with the Spanish and this would mark a period of relatively peaceful times for the Dutch until Napoleon came about. But this time period was a period of prosperity and peace, essentially. And the main things that they were revolting against the Spanish for was religion and economic oppression, as Ellie Mm -hmm. touched on already. They were able to gain this peace because they were able to seize control and hold control over the sea that was surrounding them. So as far as their development in war, they developed a lot of sea technology that was very developed for that time and allowed them to maintain control over their area. And they were also in the middle of the Thirty Years' War with the Protestants and Catholics. And essentially what they came to is they departed from Catholicism and moved toward what is now known as Calvinism. Essentially, this is a move toward less of a dictation of the elite to the lower classes and more democratic, not just in politics, but also in religion. There was more freedom among the Dutch people to develop these ideas and kind of just develop their own ways of things and focus on other things besides religion. Yeah, go ahead, Ellie. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that uh, I'm sure that this is one of the beginning turning points for the emergence of the middle class, which we see th- up through the, the 17 and 1800s. That's exactly right. And the gap between wealthy and poor, and the I should say the gap between the rich and the poor grew wider because more mm-hmm. private citizens became began to profit off of the region's success because mm-hmm. they were more able to see the fruits from their harvest, you can say, than before, because it wasn't being rooted to some king. There was actually more of a republic in the region going on, where there was representatives from each region who would come together and decide certain things for the region. It was a lot more, as I said before, a lot more democratic and a lot more 
citizens were reaping the benefits of this. Yeah, and since they were able to gain their independence from Spain, they had more control over their resources and their economy, and their economy really thrived because of that. And usually in situations like this throughout history, you see a lot of art is being produced during these times and a lot in advancement, not just in art, but in in science and other fields as well. It, it, the, society, the civilization was just able to advance further because they gained their independence. So a lot of the art that we see during this period, it's predominantly paintings. And there are three different categories of paintings that we predominantly see throughout this period, which include landscape paintings, still lifes, and portraits. So McKenna, would you like to uh, explain a little bit about landscapes? I'd love to. So the I'm not particularly, typically, a huge fan of landscape paintings because I think it's kind of something that you can come across in a museum and be a little not <laughs> moved by initially. <laughs> Uh, typically if a landscape is like something that you're like kind of overwhelmed by is because of the detail and the realism. But something that I find in this movement and during the Dutch Golden Age across not just landscapes but all of their paintings is that there is such an atmospheric quality that they have to them. Mm -hmm. And an example that I'm going to talk about first is one of the most famous landscape paintings from this time, and it is Vermeer's View of Delft. This is a landscape painting that also has a cityscape included in it that is the cityscape of Delft. And what you see here is a extremely realistic and precise depiction of the cityscape and what the cityscape does is it's so vibrant and it's so colorful you do not typically see such vi bright vibrant colors and such detail within this kind of landscape even at this mm -hmm. time it was something that was slowly being developed and the very beginnings of it are seen specifically in this painting and for those of you listening I encourage you to pull up this photo because it is a hard thing to quite capture in words, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> There's a beachfront or a riverfront with some civilians, some boats, and then there is this beautiful river that is reflecting the sky. Then you see the outline of the city. And above that, taking up, I would say, two thirds of the painting is you see this sky with these beautiful, incredibly realistic atmospheric clouds that just dominate the frame. And what I see here is this beautiful, kind of almost ominous perspective of the city where it's vibrant, there's people, you almost feel the prosperity of this city in this painting but with this atmospheric touch that is almost warping your view, wondering like, how long is this going to last? Is this a period of peace and prosperity? Is this state of the city going to last forever? Interesting. And the answer, the answer is no. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting how, you know, before we had photography, the only way to capture a moment was through painting or just kind of depicting it on some sort of surface. And so this painting, View of Delft, it really does capture the time, this moment, and uh, it's so, the detail of it is just so crazy. Like if you zoom in, you can see tiny little bricks on, on the buildings or each ripple in the water, even the ripple the ripples that the boats are making and you can almost like it's the people that are standing kind of in the foreground on the riverbank if you can almost like hear the whispers of their conversation from from offshore you know it's it's 
the level of detail is so crazy. And, and a little bit of background on, on landscape paintings during this time too. You often see that two thirds of the composition is made up of just sky, like this painting. And that's because the Netherlands and this area is at sea level. And so a little bit of geography background, I guess, the ocean was to, the Atlantic Ocean is to the west and they have the coastline and then they have dunes, which are a little bit high up or a little bit elevated. And then they have to the further east, there's a bay and that's where Amsterdam and all these cities were. And they had canals attached to the bay. So a lot of these paintings were depicted from, from that perspective, from the dunes looking down on those cities. So that's why they only took up about one third of the composition. That's so interesting. And to have this reasoning behind why it's painted in such a way, why they made these decisions, it helps contextualize when you're looking at it in person. And when you come up to this painting and you see it, this, the qualities of it and the way that it's painted as if you're, you yourself are standing on top of the dune looking out at this city at this time. It's quite an overwhelming feeling. What I get from it is almost kind of the same. It's interesting. I almost feel as though I'm looking at like a picture of like a galaxy. Hmm. It really like, it's so encapsulating that it kind of does like remind me of how small I am and how large the forces of nature are. Right. Yeah, that's something that a lot of these landscape paintings tried to achieve as well as kind of the conflict, I guess, or kind of the interactions between man and nature. So you would mm -hmm. see things um, that would be large landscapes that are kind of panoramic and there would be lots of lush green rivers, just it would be so green. And then you just see all these man-made bridges buildings, churches, little farms, and that's kind of speaking to the intersection between man and nature, which I think is really interesting that it's, it's depicting it in this kind of concept in that way. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And another painting I'm going to bring up is a mountain landscape dated 1637 by I apologize to anybody who can actually pronounce these names correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to guess it's Segares, Hercules mm -hmm. Segares. And he has, he created a number of mountain landscape, but they are extremely panoramic. They're almost as if you're looking at a painting through a fisheye lens. And he is almost directly responding to not responding necessarily, but departing from the former mannerist style of landscape paintings, which had the extravagant birds, very exotic creatures often depicted mm -hmm. in them, almost a surreal idealistic depiction of nature and taking it and kind of taking away all of the fluff and idealistic properties of them and really moving toward a more realistic depiction of this just immaculate, incredible area that they are surrounded in and really just inserting himself within the landscape as an observer and capturing quite literally all he possibly can in such a limited canvas. Right, yeah, I think that as we can see in this painting definitely and throughout a lot of Dutch art during this period is artists and kind of society in general kind of advanced towards reconnecting with nature as they were moving out of kind of the really rational and scientific period of the Renaissance, you can see this desire to reconnect with nature, which extends and ex is exaggerated even in the Baroque, which this period is definitely sort of a transitional period into the Baroque, which you can see throughout a lot of the art that we'll be discussing 
Yeah, exactly. Ellie, that was a really great point about what you said about the transition into Baroque and how we can see this in other styles of painting. Mm -hmm. And something that I think is that we can really, it's mainly evident in my favorite and 100% (laughs) your favorite uh, styles at this time, which is the still life paintings that came out of this time. Absolutely. I definitely think that the still life painting from this time is contrary to its name, still life. You think that would be really boring. I think it's the most interesting, I mean, debatably, you know, arguably, one of the most interesting types of art that there is. And McKenna and I, and I actually were able to view a lot of these paintings firsthand when when we were still at UCLA and we had, we took a trip to LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and they have a whole wing that's completely dedicated to the Dutch Golden Age and including a lot of still lifes and paintings that we are going to be sharing with you as well. So I would highly recommend seeing them in person. It's a completely different thing than seeing an image of it on your computer or in a book. So just putting that out there. (laughs) And I would like to point out for those, anybody who is in the Los Angeles area or really in any metropolitan area, most museums will be open for scheduled tickets by mid-September. So if you have the opportunity. That's good to know. Yeah. Fun fact. If you have the (laughs) opportunity to schedule some time, get out of your house And especially now, you have so much time to spend with these paintings and it's hard to, it's hard to look away. Yeah. Of course, do it safely though. To transition back to still lifes. So there are three different general generations during this period that we see. The first generation is, um, like you said, the Mannerist style, and that's kind of growing out of the style that was typical during the Northern Renaissance. And you can tell the style apart because the figures kind of look almost alienish. Their their features are a little bit exaggerated. They kind of have curved forms that are are that might might look a little odd to you, versus as compared to, for example, the figures that you see in the in the High Renaissance in Italy. Those are are usually very proportional and very realistic. For mannerism, it's kind of a focus less on proportion and balance and and ideal beauty and it's focusing more on the asymmetrical and unnaturally elegant. Yes and you can see this very clearly in Goltzius. Goltzias? I cannot pronounce his name but he has a painting that is excuse me an engraving that is without Ceres and Bacchus, Venus would freeze, dated Mm. to the early 1600s. And this is an allegorical painting with obvious ties to Greek mythology. But what you see is these incredibly disproportionate figures, roughly four of them, who have these impossible proportions. I mean, if you if you took the measurements of the main figure in this woman who is kind of in a Venus-like laying down pose, she'd probably be about seven feet tall and her (laughs) legs would take up only probably about a fourth of her body. And even her breasts are kind of oddly positioned on her body and everything is elongated, but it's almost in a way that you look at it and you see it and you question like what exactly is like what's off about this right yeah what i love about this piece in particular is the element of chiaroscuro which you can see which is the intense contrast between the light and dark here which the light source of this composition it comes from the torch that this cube this cupid is holding Um, But it's just very unusual, typically, to see this level of blue hue in there that's adding to this chiaroscuro element. I just find that really unique because typically you you just see kind of a dark, like, brown, blackish color mixed with these light yellows. 
So I just think that's really interesting about this particular piece. Yeah, and I think it's also a good, it's a great transitional piece into still lifes because right. of the eventual emphasis on chiaroscuro and how important this eventually becomes. Yeah, so we see this chiaroscuro throughout a lot of these paintings. And like, for example, Jan Bruegel, his bouquet from 1606. This is a, an an example of this early first generation still life painting. And you can see that the flowers look perfect. They they look like they've, you know, they're petrified in like a beautiful form. And the background is like a almost solid black background. There's a lot of light on the flowers. And but this painting in particular to me, it re reminds me of like the early classifications for taxonomy and and different species of, of flora and fauna. And it looks like something a scientist would refer to to pick out different species of and identify different species of flowers. So it, they just look very, very perfect. And same with the, the seashells and the butterfly at the bottom there. They just look like you could find them in a textbook. It's just like so such perfect examples of, of each type. If that makes sense. Ellie, that makes total sense. And it's it's so interesting because I very often find myself comparing the these early still lifes to like an almost like an anatomical drawing mm -hmm. because it's right. so it's so exact and it's almost mm -hmm. each flower is facing you to mm -hmm. show you exactly what it is. Right. But and it's I still Go ahead. Sorry. I believe that these flowers were each painted individually and then into this bouquet. They weren't actually arranged and painted from a bouquet that looks exactly like this. I believe they were painted individually and put into this composition that it is now. It, I, I would believe it because it's almost impossible to imagine that a bouquet could be positioned. Right. It's almost yeah, like it's, it's defying gravity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And for that tiny vase too. It's like I don't know how they found flowers like that. Yeah, it's such a it's such an interesting choice for an artist to create such such an extravagant bouquet especially at this time. Right. And Ellie, I'd love to hear your opinion on why you think it is that they that they were so why they were the way that they were, why they were so perfect in this first wave of still life painting during the Dutch Golden Age. I would say that this here is probably coming from the influence of the Renaissance, where before, like before we mentioned that they're kind of breaking apart from it, but this is still where they're a little bit attached to the Renaissance, and so they're looking to create these botanical studies and scientific scientifically capture these different species of flowers and shells and 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 insects as well. Yeah, I would I would say that it's probably coming from that drive, that scientific drive. Yeah, and on top of that, it's also a way for them to demonstrate how developed they are in trade because not all mm -hmm. of these flowers are <laughs> from this region. And right. it's a way to show the different regions that they are importing from and kind of like how prosperous of a nation or a region they are. Yeah, and, and in a lot of these uh, floral still lifes, you, you'll see tulips in there, which was the hot commodity of the Netherlands or the Dutch Republic at that time. And it even got to a point where tulips cost more, it was cost more than the dollar there or like whatever the currency was then, which ended up crashing the economy a little bit there because they kind of got a little bit too excited about the tulips, but <laughs> it was so much of a, of a hot commodity and, and, they're, and they're really trying to showcase how, how they had these different species of tulips and different hybrids available then. So that's why you, you, you'll often find tulips in these still lives. So interesting. 
Ellie, yeah. do you want to continue talking about like all of these different like fl floral arrangements? Yeah, yeah. So um, another interesting one is uh, from another one from Bruegel, which is it's called Flower Still Life. A lot of these are called Flower Still Life or something similar. Um, and this one is a bouquet, a smaller bouquet, but it's in a really nice little glass vase, a clear glass vase. And I think this one is really interesting because the glass is just so well depicted. And I'm, every time there's glass, <laughs> I just get so blown away because it's just so crazy how hyper realistic like even more so than the flowers like the glass is like the best part to me because you can even see the light refracting through the vase like through the water onto the wooden table that it's on and the detail um in the stem of the glass and the reflections from the light source and maybe it's a window and it this this painting to me i think is just like along with so many others, just like seeing the glasses, it just blows me away. And the flowers are, are great too. And then this one's a little bit different because you can see some of the backs of some of the other flowers and, and some of them are overlapping. But I think this is another, it's, everything's transitional. So this is transitioning a little bit into the second uh, generation here. Yeah, and I love, I love that this one is almost more, it's by the same painter. Mm -hmm. And you can almost see how he progresses from the one that we previously talked about where it seems almost impossible. And this one does seem very like as if these flowers are arranged in this exact vase. And he, yeah, the way that he captures the light is, it's just truly incredible. And it seems like, it seems almost impossible that somebody could have such an eye for capturing the exact mm -hmm. light because thinking about it, this painting didn't take 20 minutes or an hour, <laughs> most right. likely took weeks, if not months to complete. And the lighting, the light source stays the same right. and so consistent and is so consistently depicted throughout it. And this is just the beginning. So we move into the second generation here. And this one, the first generation, we see a lot of floral arrangements. But as we progress further, we're seeing more of kind of a, a tabletop kind of meal scene. And so this generation has a more subdued tonal palette. It's, it's more like browns and neutral colors. Um, and the, the composition is a little bit more balanced. Um, everything kind of looks like it's all supposed to be there and it's a, at a, a typically a lower viewpoint whereas before you're kind of looking down on it maybe at like I don't know 45 degree angle now it's kind of eye level and it looks like maybe you're, you're a little a little kid kind of peeking above the table to see what you can snack on and so a good example of this it comes from Clara Peters a, a female painter during this time and it's titled still life with cheeses artichoke and cherries and it's exactly that. It's you can see there's cherries and an artichoke cut in half on a on a silver platter. There's a whole half round of cheese and other cheeses stacked on top, um, and all on silver platters. And there's a little I think that's a porcelain plate on top. And here we really we really see it's a good example of the reflections in metals as well, not just the reflections and the depictions of glass, but we see a lot of the metals, which show a lot of different tones because they're reflecting their surroundings. And so I think this is a really good example of this second generation and how it just keeps the, the skill level keeps progressing as, as we move forward. Not only the skill level, but also the development within the region at the time, we are at first we were just beginning for them to come up and develop as a region but now we see kind of the result of that in an even more tangible way than just the flowers we can see that 
even a craftsman or a painter at this time has access to these commodities that in time periods before this would have only been accessible by, you can say, the bourgeois or the elite. Mm -hmm. This is becoming a much more everyday kind of thing. More people, this is a tangible thing that they can have access to and that they can want and that they can have. And you can see that by its depiction in a still life painting. Right. Yeah. These are, these are during this period, this generation here, these are meals that they would be seeing. I mean, maybe not things like in Willem Hayda's breakfast table with a blackberry pie, things are tipped over, things are broken, but it's the foods that they would be seeing on their table. And uh, it's a little bit more, I guess, relatable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, so another example here is uh, Peter Clay's Still Life with Romer. It's the glass cup. And this one is a good example of depicting the, both the, the glass and the metal. I think, I mean, this, I just think it's so crazy how the depictions of the glass and the metal, I can go on all day about how amazing this is. And if you, if you're able to zoom in at all, you can, you can just see the level of detail. You can see tiny, tiny little specks of light refra refracting off of the metal and the glass and, and the spiral of the orange. You can see, you can just, it's like, it's almost like it's right there in front of you it can, and you can just grab it. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, for me personally, uh, Clay's is my favorite paint, favorite still life painter from this time. What we can see here, because this is dated 1645. So as this time period progresses, there is a little bit more action within the still lifes and as ellie said the orange in this is is mid peel the metal cup has fallen over and there is just a little bit more happening with the objects they're not just sitting here they mm -hmm. are as ellie said a lot more intentionally placed and almost creating a very realistic scene that you would see in the middle of dinner rather than just the contents of a meal. Right. It's like, it's almost like you got up to go to the bathroom and then this is what you're coming back to <laughs> or something like that. You know, it's, de it's definitely like a moment in time. Yeah. And something that another painting by Clay is that I love that he love to paint is a Vanita still life, mm -hmm. which is a still life that includes typically a skull. Right. Yeah, that's and one of my favorite things from this period as well is the whole idea of memento mori, which is kind of like, I, I hate to say this, but it's like the, the original version of like YOLO. So, no, it is. In and Latin, so... it means, uh, sorry, in Latin, it no, means like remember to die. So it's, it's just kind of a, a reminder that you are going to die and, and to live your life, not in vain, but it, you know, to the fullest. So a lot of symbols you would see during this, in these kind of still life paintings would be like a skull or um, a tipped over cup, kind of a, a a candle that's about to go out um, or some dying flowers. That was just kind of a reminder of like the life cycle and that like these items are all like either dead or close to death. Yeah. And it is, it's my favorite. It is my favorite type of still life that there is, is this, the idea of using this device of like this already set, kind of idea within art where you're choosing, you know, an object to paint, typically a live object, either a flower, some kind of plant or food, and capturing it in the moment. Mm -hmm. And you have this move into Vanita still life where it just really brings that in and brings it to a whole new level, as you said, and just like reminds the viewer that 
this is it. You are noticing this and you are seeing this, but there is a limited amount of time for you to take in these objects and even just looking at this painting. And Mm -hmm. the one that I'm specifically talking about is his Vanita still life that's dated to 1625. And in the left hand of the canvas, you have a candle that is about to run out. Next to that, you have a ticking watch. And then you have a skull and a dying flower, kind of everything that you could have. <laughs> and he yeah, it's got like really he, hitting the nail on the head there. <laughs> he's like, listen, it's you're gonna die. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like it, but it's really kind of a study into visual literacy, which I think is a really important thing to touch on because not painting was just uh through this prosperous time just being available to the local public this like non-religious form of painting and you Mm -hmm. have this imagine being a dutch civilian seeing a candle about to run out next to a clock next to a dying flower next to a skull it's hard it's not as though you have to explain this imagery to somebody it's this overwhelming feeling that you feel when you stand in front of it, where it is like there's a transience of life and kind of a futility of pleasure. And although we have this prosperous moment where we get to enjoy all of these new things and we can just really, I don't know, get the most out of life as an everyday person now, they have the privilege to now kind of philosophize and really look inward and be like, what does it all mean? And how can we position ourselves and like really get the most out of life? And I think it's kind of the most beautiful, kind of the most beautiful sentiment that you can get from a piece of art. Right. Do you do you think that the message was probably more like intimate or more clear to have it depicted in this way versus other periods where they might have a biblical story or like a myth uh, a mythological story? Ali, that's a great question. I think it becomes this is just my personal opinion uh, and kind of my own experience with this art is Mm -hmm. it becomes a lot more personal and it becomes Mm -hmm. something that you can finally look inward and kind Mm -hmm. of really conceptualize your mortality in a way that I don't necessarily think that religious paintings or mythological paintings can do. Because if you're looking at a religious painting, there is this idea of death of course but it's the idea of dying without salvation or without i guess i don't know the catholic term without paying your alms and there is this transitional period where you can either be you're either going to go to heaven after death or you're either going to perish and go to hell and now it's almost not emphasizing the afterlife as much but emphasizing life itself more now definitely yeah and I yeah I I agree I think that the the message is definitely it hits home a little bit more through these paintings it's because it's it's more intimate you know and a still life in general the set the scene is typically an indoor setting so it's more private and I think that it helps people understand not just that they're going to die but that their time is limited And it's also um, a great example. I'm glad you brought up the religious uh, aspect of it and how this versus a religious allegorical painting might function. And I think this is a great time to bring up the fact that religious paintings were kind of on their way out at this point in this Dutch region because in Calvinism, there's a higher emphasis on 
not so much the religious imagery, but kind of the religious message. And Mm -hmm. I think also the fact that uh, literacy rates were skyrocketing in this region. So the necessity for a pictorial education of what the Bible says versus a written one was not as necessary anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. And and you also see, like, I'm thinking about even after this period, like into the Baroque and even into neoclassicism, looking back, I think that there was a significant decrease in religious paintings. There's a lot of nature and there's a lot of kind of classical stories being portrayed. But yeah, I guess at this time, maybe we, because the liter- people were starting, starting to become literate, that need for religious paintings to kind of substitute the reading decreased. Yeah, exactly. So the third generation of still life painting, I know that you're saying that Clay's is your favorite painter during this time, but my, my favorite painter comes from the third generation. And so a good term for this generation is called prongstilleven, which means in, in Dutch, it, it means kind of like a sumptuous or ostentatious still life, which is exactly what we see during this generation. It's very, very Baroque in the way that it's kind of nature overtaking the still life, and it's like a stoic kind of surrender to these natural processes. So a good example, which we actually saw at LACMA, is from Jan de Heem, and it's called Still Life with Oysters and Grapes. And it's this table with, it's an elaborate display with grapes hanging all over the edge, and they still have their vines attached, and an, an orange that still has all of its kind of leaves splayed everywhere there's a butterfly hanging out in there and like oysters are like almost they're falling off of a silver platter and almost onto the ground and you can see that it's it this food is like it it looks like it's being wasted or it's like you're looking at like a the the day after photo after like a really crazy party or something and it's just kind of a chaotic display but like when we saw these in person, I remember looking at the oysters and they looked so photorealistic. It was so crazy. And like the level of detail here, it's like, I for me, it's like this generation is like where the detail is kind of at its peak for still lives. Yeah. And I, I remember seeing, standing in front of this specifically as well, because it's almost as if that like it looks wet, like it, it right. looks like if you touch the painting you would mm-hmm. pull your hand back and it, there would be moisture on it. Right. It's so incredible. And the overabundance of everything is almost almost overwhelming because it's like you can tell that there is this kind of idea of the excessiveness of it all because mm-hmm. even you can look at it and as you said, it looks like it's the day after. Things are almost wilted in a way. Things are going to waste. Yeah, and the craziest part about like this painting in particular and a lot of the ones from this kind of genre is that you cannot see any brush strokes at all. You can't see the artist's hand. Like that's how perfect the paint like the painting is. It's just so beautiful. (laughs) It's really stunning and just a kind of just a testament to the level at which people were painting and also a testament to typically a theme in art history is how prosperous a region or country is doing at the time can be directly seen in how realistic their paintings are. And I think this is a perfect example of that. Totally. And something else that really shows that is the content as well. So like these oysters and like in this other, I'm looking at this other painting that's from Jan de Heem and it's called A Richly Laid Table with Parrot. Like it also has oysters in this one. It has a massive parrot. It has a lot of different exotic fruits in here as well, which are not native to the Netherlands and shows the wealth of that area because these items had to be imported and it shows like how connected they were in terms of trade routes and in terms of wealth to be able to afford to bring these such exotic, you know, quote unquote exotic items to this area. 
So I think that's kind of an interesting way to display their their status is just to like it's kind of materialistic I guess because it's like look at all these things I could get you know (laughs) yeah but it's uh imagine like being a former like very poor civilian and being able to because I don't know if we have mentioned this yet but this kind of artwork was being commissioned by people of all classes obviously this is a more intricate extravagant one so it's probably a wealthier patron Mm -hmm. but it is still most likely being commissioned by a private citizen who is wanting to display how wealthy they are and if i was them i probably would too (laughs) yeah yeah if i if i could i definitely would (laughs) big flexing on the uh, <laughs> on the people you invite over for all your dinner parties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and this other one too, which is by Jan van Heysem, which is my I think I would call him my favorite artist from this time. It's called Fruit Piece and it's another it's kind of like a mix of a floral bouquet mixed with um a display of different fruits. But on this one you can see there's like ants crawling all over it and and like there's like a pomegranate that's like so ripe that it's like bursting. I think this is an, a good example of showing how they're so wealthy that they can kind of just like let this food kind of decompose over time. But it's also showing like nature taking over because these insects are are kind of taking over the scene t- too as well. You can see they're they're crawling all over everything. So it's and the background as well. It's like a forest landscape almost there's a a lot of foliage in the background and and so it's just nature taking over I think that's a really a really cool painting as well yeah and I also love this painting too because you can see this move I don't know even just like the table that it's on this like it's outside much like the other one that we just mentioned the other the Dahim originally laid table with parrots which was also set outside Mm -hmm. And there is this, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, the stand that it's on seems to be this architectural piece rather than a table. It looks like it's almost on an altar. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, kind of mirroring the, in the background, in the far background, like in the center, you can see there's some people who are kind of standing at a ledge with a railing. And so I think this might be like an extension of that railing in this really uh, jungle-like <laughs> background, you know? And I think it's really interesting too, in a lot of his paintings, he, instead of like pa- signing his signature, he signed it in a way that looked like it was etched into that stone. And so that's another detail that I think is like really amazing. It's just like, so it looks so realistic. It's so incredible. The, just the amount of craftsmanship that went into these. <laughs> And it blows my mind, honestly. And I do, we keep saying this, but (laughs) if you have the chance, (laughs) uh, even just looking up these images and zooming in on them, it is just, it's like you're zooming in on a photograph. It's almost even better than that because it's like, it's almost hyper realistic, almost as (laughs) if it's like you have, like your brain has been altered by like some substance and you're noticing (laughs) every intricate detail of an object yeah and you're able to capture that yeah I mean I I think it's so crazy I mean yeah it's like if you're it's like if you're looking at it in real life and you have a microscope or like a a magnifying glass with you you can you can really really like I'm serious you can really zoom in and see these crazy details like even just like capturing like the fuzz of like a peach or like a raindrop on a grape. It's oh my just... god, the, the dew. The dew. The dew. <laughs> That's like the craziest part is like if you look at like a peach or something or like a flower and there's like a little drop of dew on it. And it's, I think, I remember seeing that too. And I was just like, that blew my mind because it's just so, it looks like you can just kind of wipe it off like a little drop of sweat on the painting. It's just so, it's so real. Exactly. It's just, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, we could go <laughs> on all day. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to mention, too, that we will be including all of these artworks on our website, too, for you to take a look at if you can't find them. And so they'll be really easily available on our website as well. So hop on over to com. 
Okay, so the next thing that we see during this time are portraits, lots of portrait painting. And I would say that probably the most well-known artist of this time, of portrait painting of this time and of this of the Dutch Golden Age in general is probably Rembrandt. Would you like to share about Rembrandt? Yeah, I'll share about Rembrandt. Rembrandt is a fascinating historical figure, but mainly a incredible painter who has one of the most interesting trajectories in his painting because mm -hmm. something that I would like to let everybody know is that Rembrandt eventually became completely blind and was mm -hmm. mostly blind even at even in his young 20s when he was painting. Interesting. And it's something that I was told and that I think heavily influenced him and his style because he has such a, such a distinct style. It's always so lifelike. He, his paintings are always realistic, but he has this kind of fuzzy hue right. around his subjects that really kind of make it a Rembrandt painting. Mm-hmm. And something that I would love to talk about, his self-portrait that he painted when he was age 23 in the year 1629. And you see this portrait and it is a figure, it is Rembrandt, with a shadow over his face. And if you yeah. look closely at this painting, even though his face is obstructed by a shadow and the light source is coming from behind him, you can still see his eyes. And mm -hmm. you can still see the details of his face within the shadow, but it's clearly just him playing around with light sources and playing around with how if the, so if the light source is coming from behind the subject, how do you depict that shadow and how do you still capture the person? Yeah, I think that's so interesting about his work and especially his, some of his early self-portraits like this one is his experimentation with different things, including the lighting. And so having the light be against you, like to your back like that is very different. It's very, it's like counterculture almost. It's like nobody did that really. And the level of de detail that he was able to achieve, even with that kind of against him is amazing. And it feels like I were like looking into his soul right now. <laughs> And he also it experimented really... too with like the brush strokes. So like different strands of his hair, you know, he experimented with like different strands of his hair where he flipped the paintbrush upside down and he used the wooden end of the paintbrush to draw some of these strands of hair, which I think is really interesting too. It's so interesting because it's almost, yeah, you can see it's so realistic and you can like the fact that you can like pick out the individual strands of hair Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, imagine 23 painting this. <laughs> I know. That's like, that's how old I am now. <laughs> Same. And I definitely can't like, do that. Definitely cannot do that. And something I want to kind of directly compare this to is his self-portrait that he paints when he is, I believe he is, it's in 1640. So I believe he's 34. Mm -hmm. And what I find the most amazing about this is that he, the light source has changed to a more traditional, it is highlighting his face mainly while the, the back of him is in the shadows and his clothing is more shadowed. Mm -hmm. And he himself is more objectively portrayed. There's almost more life to this than there is within even his first depiction of himself. He has a way of capturing almost a like a light in somebody's eye, you could say, when right. he's painting, where it seems as though the person is looking directly at you and is in the room. You can understand their attitude as they're sitting and being painted which is a very new concept in portraiture that is developing at this time. Right. Yeah. The level of detail, like his eyes look so like glass, like they, like you can see deep into his eyes and the level of like lifelike aspects to it, like the rosiness in his cheeks and you can see there's pink tones in his nose and 
and like the rosiness on his lips and stuff and the undertones of his skin tone just the level of detail is crazy in this too like the fur as well you can see like tiny little individual strands of fur and um i think rembrandt is really successful in the way of making his subjects look really really lifelike but also he's doing that while still showing his hand you can see his brush strokes often and I think that's really unique in the way because, you know, when you think of, for example, like impressionism, that's like the, the figures don't often look very personal or realistic because they're, you can, the paint strokes are just all over. But this one, you can see the paint strokes, the brush strokes, but the person is just so real to you. It's such a hard thing to be able to do, like mm -hmm. to make it so visibly a painting, mm -hmm. but try to create this presence and personality of the subject. Yeah, and I think something that he was is most known for is this term called penumbra, which is it's kind of this subtle transition between shadow to light. So you can see that in his self-portrait and in a bunch of his different portraits. It's just it I think it helps show the form in more of a realistic way because it's showing the, these different contours and just kind of the shape of these figures like their faces and, and their bodies as well. So in this self-portrait of him where he's wearing this fur, like I think the form just looks so three-dimensional to me. It's like I can almost see him breathing, you know? I can imagine yeah. him breathing right now. Yeah, exactly. I, I know exactly what you mean. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on his portraits of other people? For example, like his portrait of Dirk Jan Pesser. I think that they're probably because they were commissioned, they're a lot less experimental than his self-portraits. So you can see that the light source is pretty typical where it's kind of kind of head on. So you can get a lot of light and, and the shadows are kind of in where, places where you would expect. But I do think like, especially back then, you know, they were wearing these those collars. It's, the men were wearing these collars and, and it's so crazy, like the level of, of detail in the different layers and the the curves of the, the collar and even like the lace details. I think that's really, really fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you can see that he, of course it is, yeah, as you said, mo less experimental, but you can still see the, how much he's practiced on himself. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in his later self-portrait that you pointed out, the like undertones of his skin, him being flushed, it's just very lightly there. There's still so much in his face, even though it is such like a formal portrait with him wearing his formal giant white lace collar. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still like a person to this. Yeah, and like the way he was able to capture the eyes and just kind of the different characteristics of the face, it's like you can really tell what the personality of this person might have been or was. Yeah, and it's kind of as, you know, a running theme through this period is you, f you see yourself kind of just more in an intimate space. There is less of a disconnect between what is being displayed on a canvas versus what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And whereas we used to have in older versions of portraiture, it was much more static, much more idealistic. All of the paintings were mainly to portray a person in a position of power in this formal portraiture style. Mm -hmm. and kind of depict them in this perfect way kind of almost as this like beyond human and now yeah. you have these people who are prosperous and most likely still in positions of power to be able to commission portraits but they're they're so much more lifelike and so much more accessible and there's much more of a connection with the viewer Right, totally. Another area of portraiture that was popular around this time was this idea of genre portraiture, which was capturing everyday people in their everyday state, but presented in a more formal portraiture style. So as if they were sitting in a studio 
being painted and posing for this, but within their everyday life. And Mm -hmm. one of my favorites from this time is uh, the Merry Drinker that was painted by Franz Halls. And what you see here is a very kind of honest depiction of an intoxicated person (laughs) who (laughs) his, his eyes are a little bit droopy. He looks as though he's about to say something. His cheeks are flushed. But the painting itself and the color tones is very muted, except for his Mm -hmm. face. And he does look happy and he does look merry, but he is so clearly intoxicated. And he's even gesturing. (laughs) He's in the middle of gesturing with his hands, which there's something about this idea of picking up a merry drinker off of the street and saying, (laughs) hey, would you pose for me? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm such sure he loved like, that. <laughs> I'm sure he did. And he's like, of course I will. Let me tell you <laughs> about this great idea I had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. almost even, if you look at this painting, it is... It's traditionally lit from the front, but there's also this light source coming from the back to kind of highlight Mm -hmm. and kind of create again this atmosphere of how it was like, it almost seems like funny being in the studio. It's almost like funny seeing this person in mid-action. Like, I feel like I know what he's going to say or how he's going to say what he's about to say, and he's about to do it. Franz Halls capture this perfectly and without losing any detail because even just looking at the clothing that's on this person, it's mm-hmm. every day. He still he has a lesser lace collar, a less extravagant one than in the portrait that we saw before, but it's still you can still see like the almost like the threads coming undone at the edge of it, the shadows created by them and all of the frayed pieces of clothing that are on his whole outfit. Mm -hmm. And even the glass in his hand, it's filled with a liquid that is the same color as his entire outfit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But you can, you can still see the glass being perfectly depicted with just like the refractions of light through it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, something that I love about a lot of these paintings from this time, um, especially like the more relatable ones like this one, I guess, <laughs> is that they they use the artists often use a very warm toned palette, and it's it's I think because of that it's it's more inviting and it it feels like we're sitting with him in like a tavern or something. We're just hanging out with him, and he's like telling us a really good story or something. And, you know, like the other still lives with, the, with with like the cheese and the artichokes and stuff. It's like, it's a very inviting painting and it just, it feels like it wants us to be there with them, you know? It wants yeah, us to jump it's right a very, in. it's a very like warm, welcoming moment that he's capturing. Mm-hmm. Well, something that wasn't very warm and welcoming during this period, actually, it's called the Dutch Golden Age, but a lot of it wasn't very golden. And like a lot of different periods, throughout history where an economy is able to thrive, it's often as a result of the exploitation of others. So it's important not to forget the fact that the Dutch Republic was so successful in its economy due to its participation in slave labor and the slave trade. And it's important to know that during this time as well, they were developing the New York colony in what is now the U.S. And that was heavily reliant on slave labor um, and how they were able to get all these exotic objects and foods and items, I'm sure it it involved exploitation of not just slaves, but those from different cultures in like Asia and the Middle East and along those trade routes as well. So I think that's important to to acknowledge and recognize that even though there was a lot of great stuff that was produced during this time and and there was a lot of wealth in the area, the wealth wasn't equally distributed and and not everyone was successful during this time. Yes, Ellie. And that is definitely something that is important to know. And even taking into a fact that things were being 
there was this, you know, economic explosion, you could say, but it was one of those things where the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. And it was, it definitely was not equally distributed and not, not everybody was feeling this period of prosperity in the same way. And I think that There were also a lot of women, female painters during this time too, who art historians are aware of and, and recognize, but it's not very well known to kind of the general public. And we do see with Clara Peters and even beyond into the Baroque and 18th century, we recognize more female painters, which I think is great. And we don't really see that at all before this time. But there are a lot more female painters that are prominent during this time, like Judith Leister and Maria Marion. They're also great painters during this time, but they just aren't as widely recognized. So it's important to highlight those who are usually left behind during time periods. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And without, you know, people recognizing them, they kind of do just get forgotten and thrown to the wayside. But I will say, uh, as a final note, though, that I do love this period of art. I think that it's amazing, not just from a, a personal subjective standpoint, but I think objectively, the level of skill and the technique and just the amount of detail is so crazy. And I think it's the amount of detail, especially on a miniature scale, is akin to like the miniature Persian paintings that we've seen. It's just, it's very, very impressive. And I, I've met people before that can't really get with like contemporary or modern art just because they, you know, they're like, oh, it's a five-year-old. My five-year-old could do that or whatever. And, and even after learning about it, they're still like, well, it's not that impressive, which to each their own. But if you feel that way about about modern and contemporary art, I would highly recommend the Dutch Golden Age because this is where you really see, in my opinion, the peak of technical skill, technical painting. Ellie, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And to kind of piggyback on that, I think that the Dutch Golden Age is such a great way to get into art if you are somebody who doesn't, like myself personally, doesn't vibe always with contemporary art or modern art, it is the kind of art that you don't necessarily need, let's say, a trained eye. Whereas sometimes you can see older religious paintings that might be incredibly impressive on a technical scale, but don't really do it for you because you don't connect with them on that level. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I think is so well done within the Dutch golden age is capturing and really portraying these feelings and they are depicted in such a way that when you stand in front of them, it is so kind of awe-inspiring and incredible that you get swept away in it and you're feeling it, even though necessarily you might not be educated on art. It is a great way to appreciate art and also face some more intimate feelings that art can bring about. As we were saying before, there is this idea of, you know, death is always waiting. And in the landscape paintings, there's this ominous feeling, this like unavoidable tragedy. Mm-hmm. And that's ready to kind of sweep all of the beauty away that's happening and being captured right now and kind of instill this thing in yourself as a person viewing it that you can go find this beauty within real life. It's almost as if somebody had to paint it and put it in front of you for mm-hmm. you to notice it. And it makes you more appreciative of the things around you. And I don't I don't really know what else more you could ask from a painting. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely I agree. I think it's it, it, for those who want to get into art, this is definitely something to start with because it is so intimate and it, it does make you really think about not just art but about yourself on a deeper level from both the close-ups of the portraits and the still lifes and also the deep panoramics of the landscapes as well. So for anyone out there who's looking to start with something, this is it. Well, 
I would like to thank everybody who has joined us for our second episode. And we will see you next time. Yeah, thank you very much, McKenna. And thank you for everyone listening. We hope to see you next time. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to this episode of the Air Edition podcast. Don't forget to check us out at our website and subscribe at airedition and follow us on Instagram at airedition magazine.